Thank you. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we have some very exciting news here today, and I'm delighted to be joined by the, the all-star team that represents us first in government, in labor, and of course at the Port Authority. So first I want to acknowledge Rick Cotton. I had a chance to say some words about him at the 100th anniversary of the Port Authority. The 100th anniversary is coming down in the last two weeks here, so if you haven't celebrated, come on, keep it going. It's going to be another 100 years. Uh, and, and Rick is the embodiment of the phrase that leadership matters. And what he has done on behalf of New York has been uh, visionary. He gets the job done without a lot of drama, and we work very, very closely together. And I'm so proud that he is the executive director of the Port Authority. Also, Kevin O'Toole, uh, our friend across the water from New Jersey, uh, another individual who's so committed to just getting the work done, making sure that we do the right thing between our two states. And I want to thank him as the chairman of the board, uh, Kevin O'Toole. And uh, Gerard Bushel, Bushel uh, executive director of Terminal One, got a lot on your plate. Uh, we are very confident in your abilities. I had a chance to work with you in the past administration. I look forward to continuing that relationship. Also, uh, our elected leaders. I've had a chance to work with Congressman Greg Meads since uh, a decade ago when I landed as one of your colleagues in Congress, and you have continued to just make sure that your constituents are so well represented on projects like these, bringing their concerns to the table, working with us, getting it done for the people. And I want to applaud your incredible leadership here, but also for our nation. And Donovan Richards, someone who's become a great friend of mine, our, our, I've called him BP affectionately, but our Queensboro president. He is everywhere. Uh, I don't know that I've ever been to a church without him in there preaching as well. And I just, just did my preaching up in Harlem yesterday before I went up to Buffalo to deal with the storm. So, uh, but I see you everywhere. You are out there, a man of the people. So thank you, Donovan Richard. And representing the thousands of hardworking men and women of labor, Gary LaBarbera, president of the Building Construction Trades of Greater New York. I, I could not think of a greater partner, someone who just wears the needs of the people that he represents on his sleeve. Every time you see him, he's saying, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. And I don't know that we'd have the, the scale of the projects with the, uh, the project labor agreements and all the uh, issues that relate to in training our next generation of workers, so important, diversifying that workforce. Gary and I have had many conversations about the desire to see more people of color, more women on the work sites, and he understands that and is doing everything. So, so I just want to say uh, this is a team of individuals that is unsurpassed in our nation in terms of the people who get things done. I also want to thank, uh, I've got a couple of announcements here today, and we plan with an announcement here today to transform JFK into, I'm told to say, one of the top airports in the world. I don't know why I can't say the best airport in the world. And we are going to be building a state-of-the-art Terminal 1. And this is a very big deal. And how does this happen? When I first uh, landed in this job, as I'll say, I landed in this job at the end of August, I wanted to see a whole scope of all the projects that have been talked about for years, but have been pent up or delayed or sidetracked for whatever reasons. Uh, some may be set aside because of the pandemic. Others times it was funding. Others there thought that we can only do so much at a time. And I said, you know what, just, just give me the one that's really bold. Let's take a look at what's out there. That'll send a statement that this administration knows no boundaries in terms of its capacity to dream, to dream big, be ambitious, but also we have this unique moment in history when that ambition is met by the ability to have funding sources. And I think our leaders in Congress and our white, in the White House with President Joe Biden and our leadership with Chuck Schumer. How great it is to have Chuck Schumer, the majority leader of the entire Senate, our own member of, Sen of the Senate, as well as the leadership that we have, Greg Meeks and so many others who work on these projects. This is where a lot of the credit goes because they are believing in infrastructure the way we always have here in New York. They know that this is the catalyst. This is our opportunity to help lift people out of this pandemic and give them a chance to go to a job that they never, never even thought of themselves in. 
They may have been losing their job because it's never going to come back because of automation or the pandemic, whatever reason. They just never viewed themselves as part of building this great city and this great region. And now I want those opportunities. So the we have met the moment and the moment is now. And we need to continue focusing on our airports. And I want to talk about a little bit about how fact that this is long overdue. And I love the airports. I mean, I have spent more time in the airports than anybody other than someone who's got a Port Authority badge, right? Uh, and I saw them particularly over the last seven years uh, flying from, I was here literally every single week, multiple times back and forth around the state. So I, I think I know every single person and I thank everyone from those wiping the counters in the restrooms and those who are serving people at the restaurants and those who are continuing to, uh, you know, line us up in some fashion to get forward a plane. These are the people who have been there even before the pandemic. But let me tell you, my friends, during the pandemic, they showed up every single day when everybody else was staying home. They were there on their jobs. And the fact that we were able to continue doing construction and projects, great fear was permeating throughout our society, throughout our community. It was real. People were losing their lives. And these brave heroes kept showing up. So to them, I'm forever grateful for what they've done. And also, what this city deserves after this pandemic, brought to our knees, hit so hard, this is our moment to truly shine. And this is, as I said, the stars have aligned for us to conduct ourselves in a way that the rest of the world will say, how do they do that during a pandemic? How do they do it in the aftermath, which I hope will be very soon. And I look to the leaders and the examples of what happened during the last pandemic, 100 years ago, around the time the Port Authority was just born. And yes, it was paralyzing. We lost thousands of New Yorkers. It was very hard on the economy, you know, very similar to what we're going through now. But afterward, people decided to build. And we had the roaring 20s after that last pandemic. And that was a time of great optimism and confidence, as long as you stop it. 29, 29, 1929 was not a good year. So we're going to go all the way up to then, skip over 29 and head into the next one. So I just want to say what we're announcing here today is something that is hopefully jaw dropping for people. I want them to know that this is just the beginning. I'll be speaking much more in my state of the state address, literally in a matter of weeks about our bold vision to bring back this state after the pandemic. Again, number one, focusing on the health of the people, but also the health of the economy and making sure that we don't slide any further, that we go back to where we were and then exceed that by tenfold. So today I'm proud to announce a $9.6 billion public-private investment that will transform Terminal 1 into a state-of-the-art facility. It will be 2.4 million square feet. It's hard to imagine how large that is, but it's going to be built on the current footprint of Terminal 1, Terminal 2, and Terminal 3. That's big. That is a large space. And it'll have 23 new international gates. We are so interconnected with the rest of the globe. We want people to come from all over to find themselves right at the doorstep of New York so they find the opportunity to go here, visit New York, visit our friends in New Jersey, see upstate New York, and continue their journey across this nation. But come here first. And we have 23 new international gates. It's going to be extraordinary. We plan to be able to handle over 20 million customers a year. That's incredible as well. So whether they arrived here in coach, when they arrive and open the doors and come into our terminal, it'll be a first class experience, premium first class experience is what I'm predicting. So what we're going to have is phase A is going to be 14 gates uh, after we start construction in 2022. Can I repeat that? Did you hear that? It's almost 2022. We are starting construction in 2022. 14 gates in uh, Q quarter to second quarter of 2026. Uh, we'll have five more gates by 2028 and four gates by 2032. And I'm just going to say that sounds really far off, so maybe we can talk about this as well. <laughs> uh, I want to live to see the rest of these gates, so I, I, you know, I'm not getting any younger. So maybe we could talk about those last few gates going a little faster. Uh, but when it is done, it'll be an experience that is worthy of the name New York and the worthy of the name John F. Kennedy. And as John Kennedy once said, 
every accomplishment starts with a simple decision to try. We've done that. We are more than trying. We're going to get it done. And I thank everyone who's part of reimagining New York State as a whole, our transportation hubs, our infra infrastructure opportunities. I am so proud to be able to help lead this state into a whole new era. And it starts with announcements like these. And we're going to continue to unlock New York State's full potential and give everyone, number one, the dignity of a good job and a world-class experience and make us all so proud to be New Yorkers again. So thank you, my friends. And with that, I'd like to bring up Rick Cotton, who will go into far more details than I did. And if you got really tough questions, uh, I recommend you save them for Rick. Good morning, and thanks to everyone for, for being here. This is a very exciting day for the for the Port Authority, and I've taken careful notes, and we're going to work on those last few gates, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd also like to thank all of the elected officials in the room, including the chairs of our JFK Advisory Council, Congressman Greg Meeks and Borough President Donovan Richards, as well as all members of the Advisory Council, and I'll have some more to say about that in a minute. I'd also like to thank our partners at Carlisle, at JLC Infrastructure, and ULICO, who are our partners in the Terminal One project that we are announcing today. And I'd also like to say thank you, and it's very important, to the entire Port Authority Board for your support and partnership throughout this process. I'd like to particularly acknowledge Vice Chairman Jeff Linford and Commissioners Lisa Eve, Daniel Horwitz, and Robert Menendez, who are with us here today. Thank you for coming. I also want to acknowledge Arthur Mullins from the Terminal One Group, along with Ryan Marzullo and our other partners at Delta Airlines, who are also here with us today. And lastly, you have to humor me here, I'd like to single out the team at the Port Authority, and the governor made, made reference to this, that has worked endlessly over many, many years to move this JFK Terminal One project forward. I wish I could name everyone who played a key role, but that would take too long. I just want to call out and say thank you to Derek Utter, to Huntley Lawrence, to Libby McCarthy, Michael Farbiarge, Amy Fisher, Jim Heitman, Susan Warner Dooley, and Anna Carvalagino. Your efforts have been nothing short of extraordinary, and the region will be better for it. Today's announcement really is a historic one, and it is, as the governor said, a vote of confidence in JFK Airport. It is a vote of confidence in the recovery of air traffic in a post-pandemic world, and it is an enormous vote of confidence in the future vitality of New York and New Jersey, the entire region, thanks to the tireless efforts of Governor Hochul and Governor Murphy. We are building a new 23-gate international terminal anchoring the south side of JFK Airport. It will be built in phases. The agreement which we have reached with a consortium of three private financial partners, which is subject to Port Authority board approval at the board's meeting on Thursday of this week. It will be a new best-in-class terminal. It will live up to making and contributing to JFK being not just one of, but the best airport on the globe. And it will be 134 acres devoted to this terminal project if you include the expanded roadways, frontage, and parking. And it will entail $9.5 billion in private investment. Every penny that goes into the construction of the terminal itself will come from the private investors. $7.2 billion in design and construction costs, $2.3 billion in financing and other costs. This is the fourth project we have announced, and it w this is the final piece in the total, in our plan for the total transformation of JFK Airport. Our partners, the Carlisle Group, majority owner, large diversified global asset management firm, Johnson Loop Capital Infrastructure, 30% ownership share, and it is a 100% minority owned and controlled investment firm and part of our diversity 
commitment. And I'd like <laughs> and I'd like to call out the CEO of Johnson Loop Capital Infrastructure, Jim Reynolds, who was an instrumental voice in negotiating and bringing this discussion to a successful conclusion. And finally, Ulico, the largest labor-owned insurance and investment company in the country. Now, just to provide some context in terms of how this Terminal 1 project fits into the larger JFK footprint, on the screen is a map with an overview of the various terminals at the airport as they exist today. The blue shaded area within the yellow line covering Terminal 1, Terminal 2, and the vacant lot that used to be Terminal 3 is going to be the footprint of the entire and 250 percent larger Terminal 1. Now the Terminal 1 project will be a fitting complement on the south side of the airport to the new Terminal 6 project on the north that we announced and that the board approved in August. It will have a magnificent arrivals and departures hall. We plan to open the first phase with nearly two-thirds of the gates, but also including the arrivals, departures, roadway, and other improvements in 2026. The terminal itself will have 2.4 million square feet of terminal space, 250 percent larger than the existing Terminal 1. And there will be best-in-class technology across the airport, at check-in, at security lines, every place that we can. It will have a dramatically simplified airport roadway and infrastructure to support it. It will have new frontages, which will make the experience of arriving and departing from the terminal vastly improved over what exists today. But the new terminal will not just be a major upgrade in terms of operating capabilities. It will offer a world-class customer experience. Every place in the terminal, there will be huge amounts of natural light and high ceilings. It will be sustainable in every way with a wide variety of green features, including we're targeting LEED Gold certification, all electric ground service equipment to reduce the diesel fumes from the equipment that is out on the airport today, and multiple on-site renewable and other efficiencies uh, across the entire uh, terminal. As we've done at LaGuardia, we're going to bring local New York concessionaires to the terminal, along with inspiring public art. At LaGuardia, the five new public art installations have received enormously positive reviews and feedback, and we intend to duplicate that at JFK Terminal 1. We're going to assure their family-friendly amenities, including a dedicated family security lane, family restrooms, nursing homes, and children's play areas as well as indoor green space. When you land at JFK, well, you'll know you've arrived in one of the greatest cities and regions of the world. The new Terminal 1 project will also be a major contributor to the region's economic recovery, with more than 10,000 local total jobs created and more than 6,000 good-paying union construction jobs. There will be a project labor agreement covering every single terminal project at the airport. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the thousands of construction workers who have built our previous projects and who will work and build this project. And thank Gary LaBarbera, the head of the Building Trades uh, Council, who is here with us today and who you'll hear from in a bit for his enormous support across this project and across other projects. Now we've tried to make our commitment, a commitment at the Port Authority to assuring that our construction projects benefit the communities neighboring our major projects. We are completely committed to making this a signature aspect of the Port Authority. We aspire to be a national model and a leader in implementing this commitment. And I believe that JFK is a leading and shining light, an extraordinary example of that commitment. Right from the beginning, we have partnered with elected officials and local community leaders, including, in particular, Congressman Greg Meeks and Borough President Donovan Richard, who are the co-chairs of our advisory council. They have been extraordinarily effective 
partners and advocates for our initiatives and for setting high ambitions for this effort. And I want to thank them, you'll hear from them, for their advice and support and, how shall I say, their encouragement <laughs> <laughs> to, set, to set high bars. In fact, as I was discussing with the borough president, before I met him, I actually did not have white hair. <laughs> at, at all of our projects, most importantly in terms of today's discussion at Terminal 1, we have embraced the goal of having 30% of the spending at the project involve contracts with minority and women-owned businesses. That is the highest percentage of commitment in the country. At, Lagu at the LaGuardia Airport redevelopment, which itself was an $8 billion uh, project, we just made the announcement that we have passed $2 billion in contracts with minority and women-owned businesses. That's two billion with a B. And we're committed to surpassing that at JFK. If I didn't say that, I'd be in big trouble. <laughs> with more than two billion dollars in contract opportunities coming from the Terminal One project alone. We will be prioritizing opportunities for local business and job seekers. We will be, our effort is bolstered by a JFK neighborhood outreach uh, office as well as partnering with local community organizations as part of this outreach. And we have been guided by advice from the Community Advisory Council. Capacity building and job training programs are also at the center of our effort. We have already launched these programs and we look forward to expanding them as this project moves forward in the very near future. The JFK transformation as a whole Obviously, we're announcing Terminal 1 today, a $9.5 billion new terminal project. We announced in August, and the board approved in August, a brand new terminal. Our private partners are JFK Millennium Partners, including Vantage Airport Group, American III, that's our minority-owned 30% investor at Terminal 6, and RXR. At Terminal 4, Delta Airlines and JFK IAT, are moving forward with a major $1.5 billion expansion and wholesale renovation of Terminal 4. Terminal 8, $400 million, $400 million plus actually expansion and renovation of that terminal. This is a transformative private investment, investment of more than $15 million across these four terminal projects. The result of our efforts that we have established in these public-private partnerships a multiple of five times for every single dollar of scarce Port Authority capital in private investment. And this is a, another example of our commitment to continue that leverage. Now let's take a look at what the new Terminal 1 will look like. Here's an aerial view of the major new arrivals and departures hall in the center, and you see the two concourses that stretch out to the left and right. In front, you see the dramatically expanded uh, arrivals and departure frontages. The JFK air train drop off and pick up will be inside the new terminal. Here's a view of the terminal just past security in the main passenger area. As you arrive from an international flight, you'll enter a dramatically expanded and light-filled customs and immigration processing hall. Once you've cleared customs, this is the view you will see as you emerge to walk to baggage claim. You're looking at a view of the baggage claim area with uh, extensive natural light and it, the, the iconic New York taxi cab from 30 years ago. It's not a mistake. It's actually an example of the type of public art that will be featured throughout the airport. The entire terminal is inviting to passengers in a way that a transformation of JFK should be. The project timeline, construction will start in mid-2022 once we achieve financial close with our, with our partners. And the opening dates, 2026, we're uh, opening two-thirds, nearly two-thirds, just short of two-thirds of the new gates, 14, 14 gates. Phase two will open no later than 2028. And Governor, we're working on that final date. So thank you. We're really excited and delighted to have this, this partnership in place. It took a lot of effort. We had gotten to a complete agreement 
lit almost literally two years ago. The pandemic made it necessary to restructure, but I'm delighted that we have now achieved a restructured and enormously exciting new terminal agreement. With that, I'd like to introduce and bring to the microphone Gerard Bouchel, the CEO of New Terminal One. Good morning and thank you. It is, it is great to see each and every one of you here. Um, as, as Rick highlighted, we were almost there two years ago and the world changed for each and every one of us. So it is with great joy and conviction that we stand here and really look at economic opportunity, social justice, and incredible opportunities for the metro metropolitan region, New York City, New York State, uh, and in particular, Queens and Southeast Queens. Rick, you did all the heavy lifting uh, just now, so I get the opportunity to be a cheerleader. So thank you. Um, Governor Hochul, thank you for your leadership and commitment to the people of the great state of New York. JLC Infrastructure, Ulico and Carlisle, thank you for your commitment to reopening New York through the development of new Terminal 1 at JFK. By delivering state-of-the-art terminal, you are taking a bold step forward and revitalizing the front door, the front door to this nation. You are starting up an economic engine that will create thousands of well-paying jobs in construction and inside the new terminal. We are especially excited for the opportunities we will create for the residents and businesses of Queens and Southeast Queens in particular. I had the honor, as you noted, of working on projects across New York State with you when I was president and CEO of DASNY. I am honored to collaborate with you again, this time on the largest public-private partnership in the nation and perhaps even across the globe. To Executive Director Rick Cotton, the new Terminal One team is grateful for your hands-on leadership in navigating a challenging, a challenging two years during which international borders were closed and air travel plummeted precipitously. We worked with you together with the Port Authority's senior leaders and dedicated staff across every facet of this project through early mornings, late nights, and countless weekends and holidays to make this project happen. I remember last year this time when we were sitting on Zoom calls and going through this. So this is, this is a very joyous opportunity. Thank you to the entire Port Authority team for guiding us through. It was not easy, but success breeds new opportunities and the chance for us to collaborate and execute on this new paradigm for infrastructure projects we committed to delivering. Rick, thank you for getting it done. We look forward to partnering with you and delivering a world-class terminal representing all that is great and indeed very special about New York. I also want to thank the new Terminal One team, all right, for the day in and day out work and the commitment and conviction that they brought every day uh, recognizing that there was hope, but with hope required execution. Uh, additional thanks go to Congressman Gregory Meeks. Congressman, I will speak about you in a second. Borough President Donovan Richards, thank you for your leadership. And esteemed members of the New York State Assembly, New York State Senate, and New York City Council, the hard work of each of you brought to sustain this project was incredible. Thank you for believing in us and thank you for helping us get it done. Congressman, your vision and work to bring together JFK International Airport and the Southeast Queens community is the foundation upon which we are building this project. 
Taking down the barriers between the airport and the community is essential to building out the new paradigm for infrastructure projects. Your leadership helped make this one of the most impactful infrastructure projects in the nation today. Together, we are embarking on a journey that will become the national benchmark on how to build and rebuild infrastructure with a commitment to innovation, inclusion, jobs, local participation, and strong MWBE goals. 30% and beyond, 30% and beyond. To Gary LaBarbera, President of the Building and Construction Trades, the people you represent are critically important to this project, to our state, and to this region. The New York Building and Construction Trades helped us along when confidence waned in this project. We will work together to finish, put in place a path-breaking project labor agreement committed to strong MWBE participation, local hiring, and workforce training. Gary, we've done it before. We'll do it again. Thank you very much. And through ULICO, the insurance arm of the trades and the investor of your members' pensions, labor is a pivotal player in our consortium and our project. We, we now look forward to building a world-class terminal with you. Gary, thank you again. To the new Terminal One sponsors, JLC Infrastructure, Ulico, and Carlisle, this is indeed an incredible accomplishment. As stewards, and this is important, as stewards of capital for public employees, such as police officers, teachers, firefighters, civilian workers, workers in the trades, and workers across the private sector, your assessment of risk and return is essential. You are not just deploying billions of dollars to finance a world-class terminal. You are also ensuring the future of working men and women in the public and private sectors. Jim Reynolds, CEO of JLC Infrastructure, Ed Smith, President and CEO of Ulico, and Pete Taylor, co-head of the Carlisle Global Infrastructure Opportunity Fund, you had a vision to build world-class infrastructure, create jobs and wealth opportunities, and support inclusion and community engagement. By bringing that vision to fruition, you are signaling the private sector's great confidence in New York and resoundingly demonstrating that we can build a future together. In your quest to build a $2.4 million square foot terminal offering unequaled retail, food and beverage, and the highest customer satisfaction, you have already committed in local development more than $45 million of spend for local MWB businesses. You have also supported more than 50 local organizations and offered 50 scholarships to students to flight school. We at New Terminal One are building back differently, more inclusively, and this is only a beginning. So Governor Hochul, with your leadership, we will set the bar high and challenge the rest of the country to follow. That's the New York way. You know that very well, and I know you would demand and deliver nothing less. Thank you and congratulations to everyone. And may I introduce my dear friend and colleague, Gary LaBarbera. Thank you very much, Gerard. Good. Is it afternoon? No, it's still morning. Good morning, everyone. And it's a pleasure to be here. And it's certainly a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, you've heard much about the project. I don't want to be too redundant, but I'm really here to just say a few words and, and offer many thank yous on behalf of the 100,000 members of the New York City Building and Construction Trades Council. 
First and foremost, Governor, I would like to thank you. Uh, and I do want to share just a brief story, uh, and you alluded to it in your comments. Um, literally, after a few weeks, the Governor was gracious enough to uh, take some time out of a very busy schedule to meet with me to go over some priorities for the New York City and New York State building trades. And at that very first meeting that we had, one of the first things that Governor Hochul said to me was, I want to see Terminal 1 built. I want this job built. I want this to, I want this to go forward. And I intend to do everything in my power to make that happen. And she has kept her word, so I thank you for that and for your leadership and really, really making a huge difference here in this project. Also, and obviously, I want to thank the Port Authority. I want to thank Commissioner O'Toole, as well as Executive Director Cotton and all my fellow commissioners that are here as well for their support, and also the Port Authority team for the hard work that they have put into this project. It has been a long negotiations, at times very tedious and, and tiresome, but they got through it. And of course, finally, I want to thank, well, not finally, but I do want to thank the Investment uh, Consortium. I want to thank my friend and colleague Gerard Bouchel from Carlisle. Uh, he has been a, just a tremendous advocate, tireless advocate for this project all along through its ups and downs. Obviously, Loop Capital as well. And of course, a special recognition to Ulico and Ed Smith and, and Pat White, I believe, are here. This is a very significant investment, the largest investment. This is union pension fund money. And essentially, union pension funds, union members are part ownership of this project. And this is a definite winning scenario. This is when labor, business, government, community come together. This is the result. Almost a $10 billion project creating over 6,000 union construction jobs and thousands of permanent jobs. And one of the things that I want to say and I need to acknowledge uh, Congressman Meeks, as well as uh, um, Donovan Richard, the borough president, all throughout this process, as you, as you heard, they wanted the community involved, and a priority to them was MWB participation, as well as workforce development. And in this project labor agreement, which is an historic in nature, that's exactly what we've addressed, is, is significant carve-outs for MWBEs to create and build uh, minority business-owned owned businesses to develop and get opportunity to grow and hopefully become union contractors and subcontractors as well to expand their opportunities, as well as a very, very aggressive workforce development component. You know, I've always said many, many times that the best anti-poverty program is a career. And that's what we offer in the New York City and the New York State building trades. These aren't just jobs. These are careers. There, there is significant training. We are what I would consider the most highly skilled tradesmen and women anywhere in the nation, possibly in the world. And I will give you a commitment, two commitments. One is we will work closely through this project labor agreement with all our partners to address upward mobility for underserved communities. Governor, I know you've mentioned it. We've discussed this. This is very important to me personally, as well as the leadership of the New York City Building Trades Council. Bring people up out of poverty into not just jobs, but careers, to bring them into the middle class. And two, to continually work and ensure that this will be a best-in-class project. You can go out to LaGuardia Airport, you can look at any iconic buildings in the city of New York, Tower One, One Vanderbilt, I could go on and on, and, and just look at the craftsmanship and the work of those buildings. That's the New York City building trades, their members who do that. And we give you our word that we will deliver a project. We give you our word that we will de deliver a project that will be best in class and that everyone will be proud of. So thank you all again very much for all the hard work and effort that has gone into this. Again, Governor Hochul, thank you so much for your commitment to this project. And now it is my uh, pleasure to introduce our next speaker, who is not only uh, critically important to his constituents here in Queens, but also to all Americans as his role in Congress. You know, they're dealing with many, many important issues. And Greg, Congressman Greg Meeks takes those issues seriously. He gets the jobs done. I'm very proud to have the opportunity to introduce him. Congressman Meeks, please come on up. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Thank you very, very much. This is a big day. 
And I want to start off with the governor, of course. Not just for this project, but the governor has hit the road, well, hit the takeoff path, the runway. Hit the runway run. And we are taking off. And she's already been down to Washington, D.C. several times, talking to the President of the United States, talking about build it back better, was instrumental in dealing with us when we dealt the infrastructure bill, which will also help the airport. She's talking and strategizing about her vision for our state and the country. And she's had an impact. I spoke, speak to both our majority leader in the Senate, Chuck Schumer, and my speaker, Nancy Pelosi, and they have told me already the partnership because of her vision of making sure that our state grows. And no better place to start than the transportation hub of the whole world, John F. Kennedy Airport, which just so happens to be in southeastern Queens. <laughs> and one of the things that I am so proud of being a member of Congress in southeastern Queens is the team of elected officials in southeastern Queens. They are extraordinary. And we work very closely together. And I see a few of them here today. I see Clyde Vanell, Assemblyman from the 33rd Assembly District. I see Assemblywoman Alicia Heinemann from the 29th Assembly District. And I see Assemblyman Khalil Anderson from the 31st Assembly District. None of this would have ever happened if it wasn't for that team of elected officials working collectively. Now, y'all don't know, sometimes we have our weekly meetings and conversations, and at times we may go at one another behind closed doors to try to make sure that we're delivering for the community. And that's what they do. So I got to say to my colleagues in government, thank you. Thank you for being the team that makes a difference, because while we're doing this, it's not only improving, improving our districts, it's improving the city and the state of New York, and it's leading the way for the rest of our nation. Thank you for being partners. And I'll talk about this guy when I introduce him. I've got at the same time, want to acknowledge, because another thing that the governor did that I think that is absolutely brilliant, because when we're talking about economic development and creating jobs and moving on and JFK, and we talk about working with Rick, and we talk about the community advisory group, but one of the persons, but the governor, I'm just, you know, she's playing chess on me here a little bit. So what, one of the first things that she did, because one of the people that was intricately involved in the community advisory board, and who I always went to when I was talking about developing anything and making it happen, I get a call from the governor, she says, well, you know, I think I want to take somebody on my team and make her a CEO of ESD. Hope Knight. That was a masterful move. If there's anybody that knows how to get things done and develop things, it's Hope Knight. Her reputation, forget reputation, her accomplishments are amazing. We had dreams for a long time in downtown Jamaica. Hope turned those dreams into reality. And that's the kind of leadership our governor and the vision, so I thank you for that. And Hope, I look forward to continuing to work with you. I've known Gerard Bichel when I had all black hair. <laughs> In fact, he was very instrumental, I don't know if people know this, with one of the labor unions, DC 37, when I first ran for office. He was a huge call McCall. His 
left and right hand at times. And his determination, his hard work, and this was hard. I mean, I don't think any words can describe what went through in getting this done. And then it was hard without COVID. You add that on addition there too, not knowing the stability of the economy, trying to hold it together, trying to predict the unknown because we've never seen anything like this in the history of the United States. And that goes back to the plague that we had in the, in the, in the uh, late 1900s, early 1900s. Investors don't know what to do to call our group, trying to predict because the same thing, we try to bring the community together, but I understand nobody's in this business to lose money. So he had to go back and forth and work and try to keep this still together. And he, you know, insisted, just as I did, that we've got to make sure that this inclusion of people in the community, women and minorities. Gerard, thank you for all of your hard work and your focus. And the partnership that Gary talked about, it can't happen without a partnership. And we get, have, it's a national debate right now. Can it be done? Government, labor, private sector. Some say it can't be done. Gary, with your work, you've proved that it can be done and it must be done and we're going to be successful building around this country. So thank you for your vision, for your leadership and your inclusion of all. Because if we're ever going to close the wealth gap in America, it's going to only be with working with our friends in labor. That's how we close the wealth gap. And you're leading the way with your vision, and I thank you for that. In this deal, and we talked a lot about it, and what was really special to me, because when we're talking about creating jobs, you've got to talk about creating all kinds of jobs. But there's one aspect that I always thought that was missing, particularly when you talked about the minority community. You know, in southeastern Queens, we have a saying. We say, led by my predecessor, quite frankly, I'm going to give him the credit for it this time, and then I'll keep it for myself next time. But in southeastern Queens, we're basically a homeowner community. And those that don't own a home, we have this saying. We want you to rent the car and buy the house. Why? Well, a car is a depreciating asset, and a house is an appreciating asset. And if you want to get forward, you want to have something that you've invested in and have equity in. So what our communities have not had a lot is equity. So when I talked to Rick Cotton, and I'm saving him for last, and I said we have to have some people with equity interest in the property. We want the 30%. That's really important to us to have the 30% in contracting, uh, in concessions, 30% all the way down the line. But what has never been considered before in this country was when we talk about 30%, 30% equity in the deal. Rick jumped right on board. And when you talk about the combination of Jason Loop, Johnson Loop, 30% equity owners in this deal has never happened. When I tell my colleagues in, 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 in Congress, and I talk to my colleagues, particularly in the Congressional Black Caucus, that we got our executive director to do that, they are shocked and, and, and amazed and want to know how did we do it. So we are, in fact, leading the nation. It has never happened in the history of this country. And you heard Rick talk about it's Terminal 1, but you heard him talk about the equity, the 30% equity interests in the other project that's happening at JFK also. Landmark, first time leading the nation. And this man, Rick Cotton, has kept his word. I, I, I've been in Congress. Yeah, he deserves it. This man. <laughs> I 
I've been in Congress, and I'm going to close, 22 years. I remember when I first came here, the Port Authority was not a friend of the community. We were fighting with the Port Authority every which way. We had no economic interest in it. We had no real jobs in it. We had a lot of excuses that were there. But this man, Rick Cotton, he sat down. And we talked and we dialogued and he challenged me. Who can we get? Where are they? You get them, I'll put them to work. We'll do it. Let's work it out. And he has, we call meetings, because when we talked about 30% interest, inter, uh, equity in it, that's Loop and Johnson. And you look at their involvement, in the negotiations, because this is not something that you know, call sweat equity. This is not something that is behind the scenes. They put up their money and brought in a team that is as diverse as our city, our state, and our nation. And that's what this is really all about. Because we can talk about reducing the wealth gap, but we also got to talk about increasing the wealth. And that's what this project, and that's what this man did. So when we talked about this project, he also talked about bringing in minority lawyers, accountants, engineers, architects. Because we have these firms, they never had the opportunity before. This project opens those doors, and that is because we had a true partner. I never will forget you, Rick, because you stood by me and you kept your word, and you delivered, and you're still delivering. So thank you. I see Alicia Eve here, and I got to just say, because it reminds me, I got to give credit. There's a man, you know, from where you're from, Governor, from Buffalo, New York, when I was just a little kid coming in, by the name of Arthur O. Eve, who said to me, we have got to make sure that we own property and deliver for our folks. So please, I always see you, I always think of Arthur, and how he has inspired me to go on to be a public official. Thank you. Thank you for that. And so now let me conclude by bringing up someone else who's a partner. He's a friend. Some of you, you know, we talk about leadership, etc. He's still in his 30s. Just got here, really, you know what I mean? <laughs> Alicia's saying she's not that much older. <laughs> <laughs> but we had to have a partner in the city, in the city council, to get this done. We had to have someone, because there was some negotiating that had to be done by, with the city. There's city dollars and moving forward and land uh, leases and everything that had to be done. So when we started this, he was my friend and partner in the city, getting it done, negotiating, working, making it happen. Because if he hadn't got some of those deals together, we might not be here today. And lo and behold, he decided that he wanted to do something else. And he came and he became elected the king of queens. <laughs> and as Rick has said, he's everywhere. He understands how to bring people together, that the borough of Queens is open for business, and we'll get it done. And he's become my partner of the community advisory board. And I got to just say something about that community advisory board. Every member of that, that, I mean, that's another brick cotton piece. Pull that community advisory board together. And when you think of all of the community groups, everybody that has an interest in Southeastern Queens, everyone has an interest in the you know, people surrounded in the 5th Congressional District, including into Nassau County. They are all part of the community advisory board, working and meeting and talking and going back and forth. It's something that is unbelievable, hard at times because everybody had their own interests, but unbelievable. And now my co-chair 
of that advisory board is none other than the person that I'm going to bring up, the borough president of Queens, Donovan Richards. Wow, thank you, Congressman. I, I really appreciate those words, King of, King of Queens, huh? Well, I'm reminded every day when my wife tells me the trash needs to be taken out, how important this title is. <laughs> but truly great to be here this morning. What a historic morning for the borough of Queens. And the governor alluded to the fact that we spent a lot of time at church together. And I, I remember you giving this sermon, Governor, you said, faith without works is dead. And I want to thank you for not only being faithful to the borough of Queens, to the people of our state, but also making it work. So thank you for your leadership. We would not be here without you today. Thank you. <laughs> to Rick Cotton, who says that I gave him white hair, I have none left because of you. So I want to thank you for your leadership. And really, it, you know, sometimes conversations can be tough. But one thing I can say about the folks in this room that I work together with, from Gerard to Gary, we all have one interest at heart, and that's to make sure that New York State is a better place, that we're leaving it better than we found it. And I think this project is a great model, an example of what can happen when private partnership, public partnership, when you have unions, when you have community, when you put all of this into a pot, how this stew is made. This is an example for what and how government should function as we move ahead. So I want to thank each and every one of you for your leadership. You know, there's been a lot of talk coming out of this pandemic about building back. And you sort of look at where we're at in our county. You, you wonder why this pandemic exacerbated many of the issues that impact specifically communities of color. When we think about Southeast Queens, all the way to Corona, to East Elmhurst, why were these communities the most impacted during this pandemic? It's called inequity. When you look at the impacts on education, when you look at the impacts on infrastructure. Just a few weeks ago, the governor was out in Southeast Queens, out in Elmhurst, touring the devastation of Ida. Lack of investment, lack of real will in putting community first in a lot of these times. So we've made this commitment, not to simply just build back, right, Congressman? But to build back better. And it's one thing to invest capital dollars, and we talk about these things so lightly. We say we're going to invest capital money into gray infrastructure, into green infrastructure, but it's really about investments in human capital that are the most important. When we talk about the livelihoods of people surrounding this airport, the people most impacted, I live in the flight path, you know, we are the communities most impacted by the noise. Governor, you're going to help us with this traffic situation when we build this uh, airport, too? That was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Pollution. You think of all of these things that impact the communities around the airport. And for many years, for decades, I don't want to show my age, we've always said, well, how we're impacted by these things. How are they helping the community? How does this airport help the community? This project, right, Brian? Community Board 13 will say it. This project is, is a big project. This is going to help us to address many of the things that exacerbated this pandemic in the first place. The congressman talked about equity, ownership. People in Southeast Queens aren't looking for a handout. They're looking for a hand up. This is what this project represents, ensuring that the people most impacted are the ones at the table. And that's what the advisory board does every day. 
fight to ensure that although we're most impacted, when those jobs come down the line, our children shouldn't have to move to Atlanta or Manhattan or move to this forsaken place, Manhattan. No offense, Governor. But we want to keep jobs in Queens. We want Queens to be a place where we live, work, and play. You shouldn't have to leave your borough to find a great job, and good job at that, as Gary LaBarber spoke of. So this terminal is going to be a world-class terminal. I'm tired of flying around the world, seeing other terminals, and saying, why is JFK looking like this? We're not reaching our full potential. This is the world's borough. When you come through Queens, we don't want you to think, all right, I won't say the third world country thing, but we want you to know that this is the best terminal. This, there is no better place than Queens. And we want you to have that experience. And this project is certainly going to provide us with that opportunity. So to Gerard, to everybody who's made this day possible, I might have been in office probably two weeks when we started to talk about this project. The congressman calls me, and he's, he's like LeBron James. Congressman Meeks, there's so much to say about him and his leadership. And one of the things I've come to learn, because it's important to have mentors in this business, is that he doesn't just talk about equity and press conferences and building equity. He talks about it behind closed doors. And it's about not just talking about it. It's about deeds. And I want to thank you, Congressman, for being a mentor. Um, for helping see this project through. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with you on this, starting as a council member, moving in to BP. It's been a lot said today, but I will leave you with the theme that we often say in Queens, and that is Queens get the money. And today, we certainly are achieving that. God bless you. Great day for Queens. Queens is open for business.
exciting news we just delivered. There's a lot of energy around this, and as you heard, it's got a huge social equity component. It's going to do so much to lift up the neighborhood of Southeast Queens and create opportunities for individuals, as well as restore a sense of pride when people land at JFK and they live here and they know that the rest of the world is seeing a facility that is second to none. So I was really proud to be able to preside over this today and thank again, once again, Rick Cotton, our executive director. And at that point, I'll be happy to take some questions. Governor, many counties are, 10 executives are saying that they're not going to enforce this new mask mandate. What is your response to that? Does it undermine the effort that you're trying to do to have a, a you know, statewide policy? Well, every county is different and I've spoken to many of them. Some county executives have asked us to do this, so they have what I would call air cover, something there. I've had calls from even in some of the, uh, the more rural areas where they're grateful that we did this so uh, they can explain that this is a statewide mandate. So there's a difference of opinion. I do have faith in New Yorkers. I believe the vast majority want to do what's right. They want to put this pandemic behind us. They want to make sure we never have to go back to the days of been, being in lockdown, where you couldn't go to work, you couldn't go to schools, you couldn't go to worship on a weekend. And so we're not going to do that. And I said very strongly, this is all about two things, protecting the health of New Yorkers and the health of the economy. And I believe we accomplished that. So I do hope that the businesses will enforce this and that individuals will understand how important it is. It's a temp temporary measure, as long as people follow it. And uh, I wanted to make sure I gave some very clear guidelines on how that's going to be executed. It's not indefinitely. It gives a lot of options for businesses, those who already have people requirement of vaccination. No one has to wear a mask in there. That's their call. And we have very specific rules. For example, if you are appearing at a microphone temporarily, you can take it off if you're an actor or you're in production or you're in a person who speaks public. So the morning acres on the morning news don't have to have a mask on the whole time so so we've been we've been flexible in this enough but also the paramount concern is making sure we get through this pandemic get through this holiday surge which we know is a, is is with us right now governor, how are you going to enforce counties uh, and one at a time please um governor how are you going to enforce counties enforcing this mask mandate though are you going to be making sure like you said you you're hoping that they're going to come around but how in the meantime are you going to make sure that they are enforcing this mask mandate we have left this to the counties to enforce. So counties can choose not to enforce? We hope that counties will enforce it. Governor, we did speak to the We expect that they will. We hope that they will. It's in the best interest of public health, but also comes down to individual businesses doing the right thing as well. So this is also, we're asking businesses to protect their customers and to protect their, custom, uh, their, um, their employees. And this is a very short term minor effort in comparison to what the people of the state had to go through for many months when there were complete lockdowns and people could not go out anywhere and i will never let that happen to this state i will continue to encourage people to get vaccinated and get that booster shot and that is truly the best path forward so you had a question governor uh, the trade group representing convenience stores is worried about violence against clerks who try to enforce it i mean what, what do you say to the clerks and to the you know that that are dealing with a public that hasn't worn masks since jan uh, since june and really don't want to do it if they're popping into a store for five minutes i believe that they'll listen to the argument that is so incredibly simple this is a short-term measure to protect us during a change in circumstances which is that the infections are going up, hospitalizations are going up, ICU patients are going up, bed capacity is going down, and the vaccinations, while they're good, they are not where they could be in terms of uh, everyone from age five years old and up, and I want people to get boosters. So uh, we certainly anticipate that if there are any acts of violence that they are addressed locally. It, I call on people to realize this is a very minor infringement children have been doing this without much complaint for many months it allows children to stay in school something important to me and we cannot put this in the same framework as what we had last june when we stopped wearing masks the infection rate statewide was hovering around one or two percent at that time if we were still at that point if people had gotten vaccinated gotten the boosters and we were still at one percent we would not be having this conversation i warned about this for months and now we are where we are 
I'm taking decisive action to get us through this as soon as possible. Governor, Governor why are you not sending state health department inspectors to the counties that aren't playing ball? Why are you not using a bolder, as you would put it, measure to enforce this? We're going to assess the situation. I'm going to monitor what's going on in the various counties, but I'm not attempting to be heavy handed. I have a close relationship with the Association of Counties. I called them first while I was still contemplating this. I said, I want you to know that this is something that I believe in. They did not give me pushback. They understood. They just want to have this conversation. We'll continue to ask them what they need as I do on frequent calls with our county leaders. Do you need a mass vac site? Do you need more personnel? Do you need more boosters? Would you like more testing kits? I've ordered a million testing kits to go over to counties where they want them. So I, I believe that there is a strong partnership where there has not been one in the past, and we'll be there to provide the resources as they request them. Uh, last week you had said that new Omicron cases would have been uh, a major trigger for uh, new restrictions or mandates uh, because at the time when you were speaking you had not detected any more hours later there were but it still took you several days to announce this new mask and vax mandate and Omicron wasn't uh, mentioned in the explanation for it. I'm just curious about the thought process behind uh, what, what New Yorkers can look to, to uh, in terms of what to expect and when to expect new mandates like these? You'll always find for me a moderated, calibrated approach that is not an overcorrection, but will not be an undercorrection. And what I'm talking about is when we first started seeing Omicron arrive on the scene, there was a sense of heightened anxiety given what we had seen, how rapidly it was spreading in South Africa and other countries. And at the time, we still did not have clarity from the CDC as to whether or not this was something that spreads quickly like a cold or flu, but does not have se severe consequences. We didn't know at the time whether this would lead to an incredible spike in illness and therefore hospitalization. So we didn't have the full picture on Omicron. It was something that sent off alarms in terms of could this uh, deteriorate into a more complicated situation on top of the prevailing variant, which is Delta or not. We still have cases arriving in the state of this variant, without a doubt. We are hearing from other experiences around the globe that had it first, that it is not resulting in high numbers of people getting sick. But I set that calculation over here, and I'm looking at three other things and have been intensely watching those three things, which are now, in my opinion, beyond acceptable numbers. The increase in new cases, We've had since Thanksgiving an increase of 43%, a decline in hospital capacity, number of people being hospitalized, as well as uh, the vaccination rates. I want people vaccinated. We get higher than we are with people, not one dose. One dose is not going to be enough. Two doses and now with the booster, then we'll be able to say, okay, we've done everything we can. The numbers are starting to trend down. I'll watch that. So no one will be able to stand and look at me and say, oh, yes. It's a one-size-fits-all approach, or she'll make the decision based on one factor. I don't. I'm very thoughtful, methodical, talk to health care providers, talk to hospitals, talk to counties, as well as frequent conversations with people like Dr. Fauci and people in Washington. I'm gathering all the data and doing the best I can with a very evolving situation. This could be a much better scenario in two weeks if people wear the mask and get vaccinated. Then I'm, I'm looking to be flexible and say, okay, we're good. We're good. Thank you, New Yorkers. You did what I asked you. I don't, I don't know what they're going to do. Any questions on JFK? Just a quick question for Rick. Uh, is it correct that the, this terminal plan originally, the groundbreaking, was supposed to be in 2020? Is it fair to say the entire project is delayed about two years because of the pandemic? And if not, what do you think the pandemic did to the modernization of JFK? Well, in terms of the main... Like them. So we have four, four terminal projects which will be part of the redevelopment program at JFK. One, American Airlines started construction prior to the pandemic. So it is well underway. Uh, facilities will start to open up the end of next year, literally. The three other projects, which all of which were major projects, including the Terminal 1 that we announced today, the restructuring, the Delta project, and the Terminal 6 project, 
have all essentially been delayed two years, and that was a consequence of the enormous drop in, in air traffic and therefore the need to restructure those deals. Governor, we're going to make our way over to Zoom. Your first question this afternoon comes from Allura Leggard from CNY TV. Allura, your mic is open. Thank you so much. Uh, good good uh, afternoon, Governor. My question for you is there are many counties like Madison County who are opposing your mandate and won't enforce masking in indoor public places. With that being said, what are will there be any repercussions for these counties that are going against your mandate decision? And I understand that you said before that the county executives have um, this power to enforce these rules, but who's going to be holding them accountable if these case numbers start to rise? Well, I find it interesting. We're talking about one or two or three or four counties. There are 62 counties that comprise the great state of New York. I would say that the majority understand how important it is, certainly the majority where the population is, which is important to me. They understand the importance of this and are understanding that it's also a, a very simple temporary measure, which is completely driven by our need to get this under control as we approach the holiday season. So I don't have overflowing beds like I've ha seen in other parts of the state. I just arrived back from surveying storm damage in Western New York. We had to literally send in the National Guard and nurses from downstate to help relieve the pressure in hospitals that are desperately in trouble. That is all because of unvaccinated individuals occupying beds because they've been diagnosed with COVID and the symptoms became so worse that they had to have medical attention in a hospital. And to me, that is a shame because it's keeping someone out or creating more stress on a hospital system that should not have that stress after what they've been through for the last two years. So this is uh, self-induced in one sense, and I encourage the county leaders, especially those who are asking me for help to help alleviate the crisis they have in their hospital healthcare system, to look at their own actions and to see what else they can be doing to be a better partner to help reduce those cases by enforcing this. Governor, your next question comes from Nick Reisman from Spectrum News. Nick, your mic is open. Hey there, Governor. Um, I was wondering just what the status is of the uh, uh, effort to uh, kind of alleviate the uh, hospital staff bed capacity uh, uh, crunch at this point. Has there been kind of a good reaction so far in terms of, of uh, limiting some of these uh, 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 surgeries and procedures at this point, or is it kind of too early to tell? It's a little early, Nick, but we also have been in constant communication with them, and we are starting to see the bed capacity go up in light of our cessation of elective surgeries in areas where the bed capacity, in, in facilities where the bed capacity was at 10% or less. We announced that a short time ago to give people time to prepare for this and adjust. Also encouraging all the hospitals to activate their flex and surge plans which have been in place all along and that means they have to go to contracts which are state sanctioned contracts to find temporary health care workers they've done this but in the areas where they have not been as successful we've taken some of the pressure off the nursing homes and as i've explained before why do we go to nursing homes because one institution had 50 beds filled with individuals who are completely healthy but could not be returned to a, a long care skilled facility or a nursing home because they didn't have the capacity. So I brought in the National Guard and some of the other uh, health care providers to help in those facilities. Well. So we'll be happy to give you the numbers. I believe at uh, the height we've had uh, 32 or 36 hospitals that did not meet our standard and therefore had to stop elective surgeries. I will give a report probably by the end of this week to know whether or not uh, that has to, you know, headed in the track. I do believe it's getting better, though. It is getting somewhat better. Um, but we're watching it closely. That's the one, as I said, that's the one that keeps me up at night. People self-resolving at home is one situation. But when they start putting a stress on our already exhausted health care system, and I'm talking about that from every person who works there, on up to uh, the, the top executives. This has been a long, grueling, almost two years, and uh, anything we can do to help relieve that pressure cooker is one of my highest priorities. Governor, we have time for just one more question. Your final question comes from Michael Gartland of The Daily News. Michael, your mic is open. 
Good morning, Governor Hoka. How are you doing? Good morning. We've now rolled into afternoon. It's been a long press morning. <laughs> oh, God. God, I didn't even notice. Um, so I, I just want to ask you real quick, um, with the mask mandate going into effect, um, how, if you could explain it to us, this will interact with New York City's key to NYC. Um, you know, you've got um, masks now and you, you want people to be um, fully vaccinated instead of uh, just one dose at least. Mm -hmm. Can you can you just elaborate on that a bit? Well, the city's policy changes December 27th and uh, they allow business to have a one dose requirement. Uh, so they have they'll we'll be consistent with the uh, city of New York on the 27th because our state policy is two full doses. So those two requirements will align together on December 22nd. Uh, until then, uh, we, you know, businesses in New York City can continue to allow one dose, but what we're asking is that everyone have the option. The, you know, this is what I want to give. I want to give flexibility to the businesses. I am very concerned about the businesses. That's why I called many individuals who represent the business industry before we did this, and they, by and large, were supportive. You'll certainly hear from the ones who are not, but I would say, uh, by and large, they want to know that they can protect their customers and take the burden off of them as being the heavies in that sense. And they're glad that they can do this. So we'll have to have, uh, there'll be an alignment shortly with respect to the options we gave, which is wearing masks or having people with two doses fully dosed. And again, New York City uh, has a little period up until the 27th when there's, their policy will align with ours. All right, well, thank you for coming out everybody. Appreciate your time. And I thank everyone for coming out and great job on this.